Kentucky, ran an advertisement in the New York newspa uh, newspapers inviting those who would like to make the first journey to another planet to submit an application. Within a matter of days, over 18,000 people applied. These applications uh, these were then given to a panel of psychiatrists, or, or sorry, psychologists, who, uh, upon reviewing them, concluded that the vast majority of those who had wanted to start a new, uh, sorry, who had applied, wanted to start a new life on another planet. Why? Because they were so discouraged by the life on this one. On this one. And so this morning, you know, we're going to talk about discouragement. We're going to talk about, you know, discouragement. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with uh, patience the race that is set before us. Let us, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Let, uh, ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and yet, or, and ye have, ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto, uh, uh, unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Some of us need to hear that and realize that we, when we are chastened of the Lord, it's of the Lord. Why? Because he wants us to get back on the path that we are on. That's the reason. Just like a parent, a parent will discipline their child is because, not because they're doing everything right, is because they veered off a little bit and the parent wants to correct them to bring them back onto the path, right? That's what a lot of times people don't understand, that sometimes if you're having a hard time, you might want to say, you know what, is it me? Okay? Is it me? I've had asked that question many a times. Is it me? Let's look at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be uh, without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have, uh, we have had fathers of our flesh which, correct, uh, which corrected us, and we give them reverence. Shall we not uh, much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a, a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. But he, uh, for, our own, uh, for our profit, that uh, we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, uh, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. How many of you know that when you're you know, disciplined by your parents, somebody gave you a whooping, you did not enjoy it right at that moment, did you? I didn't either. Nobody does, but you know later on that it's a good thing, right? That it's a good thing that they did. And you say, well, some of you say, no, I'm still not over it. You know what? You need to get over it, all right? Because if they didn't do it, you wouldn't, you know, you'd probably be in a lot worse of a spot than what you are now, all right? Nevertheless, let's look at verse 11. Nevertheless, afterward, it, yield, uh, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which uh, hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that, uh, that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking uh, diligently, lest any, uh, any man fail of the grace of God, lest any, uh, any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Verse 18. Oh, sorry, verse, sorry, verse 16. Lest uh, there be any uh, a fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for... Uh, one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that after, afterward, 
when uh, he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Verse 18, For ye are not, uh, ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that uh, burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and a tempest. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of, of words, which voice they that... Uh, that heard entreated that the word should be spoken to them any more, for they uh, could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned, or uh, thrust through with a dart. And so trouble or so terrible was the sight that Moses said, "I accidentally fear and quake." But ye are, ye are come unto uh, Mount Zion, and unto uh, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an uh, innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the, fir of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to uh, the spirits, just men made perfect, and to, uh, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to, the, uh, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better uh, things than that of Abel, seeing that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake uh, on escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has, uh, he has promised, saying, Yet once more I, uh, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, uh, yet once more, signifies the moving of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, the, uh, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we, uh, we receiving a kingdom, we receiving a kingdom which uh, cannot be moved. Lest uh, we have, uh, lest us have grace, whereby we may uh, serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I thank you uh, uh, for uh, for Paul writing this uh, to the Hebrews to, uh, to the Jews, that they might be saved. Lord, I pray that this morning, that at the hearing of this, that there would be those in this room that would be saved and those that may be listening online as well, that they would be saved. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit this morning, God, uh, that you would lead, guide, and direct this service. And God, and I ask that we not just hear your word, but we would do your word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. And so like I said, this morning, I want to talk to you actually more specifically, you know, not about you know, uh, those, you know, parts that, uh, a lot about the parts I just read, but mainly about the first three verses. Because I think, you know, in the day and age right now, so many people are living in discouragement as believers. Discouragement is something that we all have from time to time. Don't think just because you're discouraged that you're the only one. We all get discouraged at times. Uh, the prophet Elijah that at one point got so uh, discouraged that he asked the Lord to take him now. Okay, so you're not, you're in good company if you've been discouraged. I'm not saying that it's okay for you or to stay there in your discouragement. I'm saying that we all face discouragement. It's easy for us to allow the pressures and different burdens of life to overwhelm us and to cause us to despair. Discouragement can be a killer in a lot of ways. Discouragement have, has caused many people to drop out of church. It has caused them to quit on God. It has caused many preachers to give up the fight and lay down their Bibles. We heard it, uh, we heard it with Ed Sherrill, who, who runs uh, Sabbath Rest. He said that there are so many, there are about, uh, he said about 1,800, I believe, uh, pastors a day, uh, was it a day, I believe, that leave the ministry. You say, well, how are there any pastors left? New ones keep coming up, Right. But we want you know make sure that you know there are pastors, good godly pastors that uh, continue and remain that don't get discouraged. One man put it this way: He said this. He said, in addition uh, to the immense troubles by which I am so sorely consumed, there is almost no day on which 
some new pain or anxiety does not come. Some of you are going, well, that sounds like me. Uh, Charles Spurgeon wrote this about his own battles with discouragement. It's that discouragement creeps over my heart and makes me uh, go with heaviness to my work. It is dreadfully weakening. That's how discouragement can be. That's how uh, discouragement is for a lot of people. It is that way with many of us this morning. Some in this very room are discouraged with your walk with the Lord. You're thinking about throwing the towel. You're thinking about, you're considering about dropping out on the Lord. But before you do, I would like to remind you that God did not save you so that you could live your life in a state of discouragement. God did not want you to live in that state. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. God does not want you to live in fear. He does not want you to live in discouragement. Oftentimes, you say, well, how are they together? Oftentimes, we get discouraged because we feel or we fear that we're not where we're supposed to be. Right? That we feel like we should be so much longer in our Christian walk. That we should be so much longer, you, know, uh, you know, further along in our career or any of those kind of things. The thing is, is that God has not given you a spirit of fear. That is from the enemy. The enemy wants you to think that you're not good enough. But God has given you, uh, uh, he has given you a power, love, and a sound mind. God wants you to realize that and know that, that this verse would seem to indicate that you and I do not have to live with discouragement as our constant companion. I think the Bible teaches us that it is possible to win the battle over discouragement. God has a plan to deliver you from the debilitating effects of discouragement. In fact, I think the verses that I'm about to read to you here in a moment, this, uh, in a moment will help us to accomplish that. That these verses will give us a three-step plan. You say, well, that's, you know, that's pretty easy and pretty quick, right? That's what God's Word does. It does help us. That if we follow, it will help us to fight to, uh, against the infection of discouragement as we run the Christian race. So let's take a few moments here. I want to look at these verses yet again. The first three verses, that's where I'm focusing this morning, is wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us or entangle us. And let us run with uh, patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds." Now think about that, you know, uh, think about verse 2, just the beginning part of that. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says that he who began a good work in you shall bring it to completion. So if he began it, he's also going to finish it. Here's the thing is, is that if he's the author, he's already written your story. There's nothing that's going to change that. There's nothing going, you know, that's, going to, you know, that's going to hinder that or stop that. Why? Because he's the finisher of your faith. We do not have to finish our faith. He already finished it for us. So number one is this. The first step is this. Commit to a life of faithful running. Commit your, uh, to a life of faithful running. And some of you are already going, Pastor, I don't like to run. I'm sorry, you're going to have to run. At least spiritually, you're going to have to run. All right. You say, you know, Pastor, I, I don't know about it. I, I started going. I'll tell you this. In high school, I was a cross-country runner. What's cross-country? You at least run, uh, well, during a race, you at least run three miles the fastest that you possibly can. And some of you are going, three miles? Did you have a car? No, I did not have a car. But... You at least run you know, uh, three miles. That does not mean in preparation for me to run you know, the fastest I possibly could in three miles that I did it that day. But every single day, we actually ran anywhere from five to ten miles a day in preparation for those things. 
And so commit to a life of faithful running requires preparation. It requires preparation. No one wakes up on the morning of and decides, you know what, I'm going to run a marathon today. Nobody ever does that. But that kind, of requ- uh, that kind of race requires preparation. So does the spiritual race. If we are to run well, then we must prepare properly. Freedom, we, we can't run with weights on. We must have freedom from the weights that encumber us or entangle us or that would hinder us. Anything that would hinder us from running well must be laid aside. You don't ever see... A, a marathon runner, a runner running with a giant billboard over their head. Why? Because that giant billboard is going to keep you from running. It's going to keep blowing back, right? That's why when we used to have the old church van, and Brother Doug and, and Doc and everything else, we'd be in the church van trying to pick up stuff for Convoy of Hope. If it was a windy day, that thing was, I mean, it was like a giant, driving a giant billboard down the road. It was constantly, we're constantly having to bring it back, you know, whatever, because it would always, we'd be blowing all over the, uh, all over the place. But runners will strip away all that is not necessary so that they might run faster and faster. You're not going to put something on that's going to hinder you. They get lean and they get light so they can, uh, they can win the race. That's the lesson for a Christian runner, right? Anything that has, more, uh, that has more of you than Jesus does has to go if you want to run well. Whatever has your attention Whatever has your time, whatever has your resources, whatever has your strength, etc., it is a weight in your life. It has, it has to be laid aside if you're going to run well. If it isn't dealt with, it will cause you to become discouraged. I remember oftentimes that there would be people that would run, and we would run, because we would run in rain, sun, Snow, whatever it was, and you say, oh, Pastor, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's like we were the postman, all right. You know, nothing stopped us, for, you know, from running. You would have people that would wear these big old huge ponchos because they didn't want to get wet. Well, what's uh, you know a poncho? It's like a giant big bag, you know, around you. As you're running, it would slow you down. So uh, you know what? I never ran with a poncho on. I was like, I'm not fast enough to make up for that. So I would take the poncho, and I was like, I don't need one. I'm going to go. They said, well, you're going to get wet. You're going to get a cold. You're going to get a sickness. I said, but if I do that, I'll be towards the back. All right? Because I wasn't, you know, I, yes, I did cross country, but most of the time I was a middle of the pack kind of a person. I was never really the fastest, you know, one out there, but I knew that if I put a poncho on and, there, you know, a big wind came along or just me running in general, it was going to hinder that. You say, well, that's not really heavy. But it does a whole lot of damage, doesn't it? We need to have, you know, we need to be, uh, have uh, freedom from the sins that would entangle us. The picture here is of an athlete stripping himself down so that he can run well. You ever tried to run, you know, with one of those big old huge, like a windbreaker? There's a reason why they call it a windbreaker, because it breaks you as, the, you know, the wind's coming, right? That means, like, you wouldn't... If you're getting ready for a race, you're not going to have big work boots on. You're not going to have big hiking boots. You're not going to wear jeans. You're not going to wear a big sweatshirt. You're not going to wear any of those things. You say, well, what happens if you're running in the cold? I ran many, you know, many times in the cold. You know what happens? You tend to run faster. Why? Because of the fact you want to get warmer faster. Like I said, this speaks well of the Christian runner as well. Did you know that that you will still sin after you are saved, right? Is anybody perfect in this room? Do not raise your hand because then you know what? You're no longer perfect because that's called pride. All right. And that's right. We will all still sin. We still, you know, we have a desire toward evil in the fact that our spirit is born again, but our flesh is weak. Our flesh is still sinful, correct? That will still sin. One of the biggest shocks for most people, especially those who are newly saved, is that how easily they still sin after they're saved. You're going, well, I got saved. I thought I was, you know, I thought I was good. No, you're still in this life. You're still in this sinful body. That's why you know, the Apostle Paul said, I need to die daily. Because he knew that he was going to fight 
against the flesh. He also wrote in, uh, you know, wrote in Romans chapter 7, he says, why do I do the things that I don't want to do and the things that I do want to do, I do. Here's the thing. You know, that, that thought that you had, you know, uh, it could still grow into lust. That word that you, that you didn't want, you know, to come out or you're trying to get rid of, it still may slip out from time to time. You know, that, you know, that time where, you know, anger kind of flares up in you and you get it, let it get out of control, that, that can still happen. Your attitude might, get, you know, get rotten from time to time. You know that? Being saved does not prevent you from sinning, but your sinning does prevent you from running your, way, your race well. More times that we sit there and we say, I'm going to do it my way, I'm gonna get, you know, that's going to hinder our race. That's going to hinder us as we go. Because how many of you know that this life is not a sprint? This life is a marathon. And we need to condition ourselves in that way. That we are told that there are those besetting sins, those sins that entangle us, those things that are a particular problem for us as individuals, but they must be dealt with. I deal with stuff that you don't deal with, and you deal with stuff that I don't deal with, right? And so for us to sit there and try to hold you know, somebody else and say, oh, they're so much more spiritual than I am, they're so much you know, better of a Christian, well, for one thing, maybe they've been in the, in the race longer than you, and they're closer to the finish line right? The race is not about, you know, uh, you know and, uh, it's not about a competition between you and other believers. It's about the fact of you doing your personal best. I had to get that, or, you know, in my, you know, in my thick skull as a runner that I wasn't going to be able to beat the seniors when I'm a freshman. They've been doing it for a lot longer than I have been. But the thing is, is that I would always set the goal of getting better, a better personal time than I did the last time. I was always trying to get better as I went. That we are, you know, we are told, you know, we are told, sorry, we are too sorry, remove ourselves from their presence to get away from, to, to get away from, uh, away from places where they can take place. Guard yourself against their attack. We have to, we have to get you know, honest about our sins that afflict us as believers. We cannot sit there and hide and say, I don't, or try and keep it off to the side and say, you know what, as long as nobody else sees it, it's okay. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. If you don't get rid of it, God will bring it to light. Just ask King David. King David thought that he could, you know, that he could, you know, be with another woman who was married to another man. And he thought, hey, I'm good. Problem was, she got pregnant. Then he's like, you know what, i got to take care of this because she's married, and that's my child, so what do I do? I'll murder her husband. Thought he got away with it. Set her, sent her husband, Uriah, up to the front lines. He didn't die. He came back, and he kept on trying to do it. Eventually, finally, Uriah dies. Okay. He thinks, I'm good, I can now marry her, that's my child, we're good to go. The problem is, is that David, in his arrogance and pride, thought that he could get away with it, and everything was fine, until, you know what, God told the prophet Nathan what he had done. Nathan went before him and began to tell him a little story about how this one person had a little sheep. And he said, you know, uh, and he was, this person was very poor, only had one sheep, as opposed to this other person who had many sheep, was very rich. And that this rich person, even though he had many sheep, wanted that one sheep that was over here. And so what ended up happening was, and he, he tells about how this rich man ends up taking that, what is, you know, which is not his, and he says, that's mine. David gets mad, he goes, this man shall be killed for this. Now, David, you know, just like a lot of, you know, us nowadays, we have a big mouth. We oftentimes speak before we actually know what we're saying, right? And Nathan comes out and says what? He says, you know what? You're that man. You're the rich man that took somebody else's lamb. You took somebody else's wife 
and now you're trying to hide it. At that point, then David begins to realize, and he writes Psalm 51, and, and, and comes out and says, God, I am so sorry. I, I don't understand. what. I'm, I'm sorry that I did this. I, and he comes out and he says, Lord, you know, it gets to the point where he says, Lord, don't, please, whatever you do, don't take your spirit from me. The thing is, is that if we let sin go unchecked or unconf- uh, unconfessed, God will send somebody to expose your sin. Because why? Because God wants to chasten us. He wants to discipline us. He wants us to be in a right relationship with him. Here's a story of, a, of an old mechanic that got saved. Now uh, he had a, you know, now he had, he had a foul mouth before he met Jesus. And after he was saved, he was still having the problem with his language. He talked to, a, to his preacher about the problem, and the preacher came up with a plan. He said, every time that you feel uh, like using profanity, just sing a hymn instead. A few days later, the preacher stopped by uh, the man's shop to see uh, how things were going. He asked, hey, brother, how's it going? He said, oh, pretty good, said the man. But I've sung every hymn I know, and today I made up about three or four. That's to let us know that we are still going to have problem, you know, with our sin, but God's going to help us conquer it if we are sincere, if we trust in him uh, for that matter. I was the same way, you know, right after I got saved because I had a mouth before I got saved, and I'll let you know this, the mouth came with me. Later on, he said, well, Pastor, you still have them. I, I, I guess I have a, I'm talking about in the area that I couldn't watch my mouth, and there's a lot of profanity that came out of it. The Lord will help you with it if you have that desire to get rid of it. Does that mean that all of a sudden that you're never going to you know, uh, say a profanity ever again? No. But the thing is, is that that is why James talks, us, uh, you know, talks to us about the fact of bridling our mouths to actually think before we speak, Right? This also requires patience. This requires patience. We are told to run with patience the race which, was, uh, which is set before us. We are said to be in a, uh, in a race. How many of you know that if you run or you get in those things, that's a struggle to do those things? Why? Because you're like, I'm doing something that I'm not used to doing. But how, do you, uh, how many of you know that also describes you know, the road of life you know, for us is that, is that that is a struggle as well. Sometimes life is good. Sometimes the, you know, the road and, and the way is easy. But there are other times when it feels like we're running blindfolded uphill through a minefield. Sometimes it feels like you're a chicken running with its head cut off. I never understood that until I was about, well, about Lily's age. And then I went out to go visit you know, some of my uh, farmer relatives up in Minnesota. And they said, hey, we're going to take this city slicker boy, take him out to the farm and show him a few things, try and scare him. It didn't scare me. It was just the fact that when they came over with the axe, and then they went like that, and then they tossed it, I was going, that explains that saying, you know, running like a chicken with his head cut off. Because chickens still do run with no head. It's called their nerves are still there. Some people are going, I don't think I want chicken anymore. I don't, I don't think I, 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 you know. But here's the thing. Let's flip over to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And look at verse 33. Jesus says this. He says, these things have I, uh, have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You're going to have those times of, of, of tribulation and everything else. But what, what we need is patience instead of just flying off the handle no matter what, just because of the fact that we don't understand what we're going through. Number two is this, commit, your, uh, commit to a life of focused running. As we run this race, we are to keep ourselves focused. We are to concentrate on the things that will prevent us from being discouraged as we run the race. The writer tells us what those things are. Is this, we are to focus on the person of Jesus. What does it say in in verse 2? It says, looking unto Jesus. This is how the Christian life began. It all began with a look. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 22 says this, Look unto me and be ye saved. 
all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Looking, uh, looking got us into the race, and, uh, and keeping our eyes on him helps us to do as, as we run this race. Remember in verse 1 it says, the race that is set before us. Here's the thing, is that this seems to indicate that it's each of us have our own races. We are not to sit there and say, well, you know what, I want to run Abby's race. I think her race is going to be easier. Or I want to you know, run uh, Crystal's race because I think hers is going to be better and, and better. Or I want to run Antonio's because I think his will be a lot easier than mine. I am not saying, you know, by the way, that any of you are going to have an easy race. I'm just saying. But that's the thing is, we all have our own race that is set before us. The thing is, is that along the way, when we run, we will find out that we will become discouraged as we go. I want to share a little story with you. It's a personal one. It's one of the times when I was in cross country. This is my freshman year in high school. And if you ran like me, there was usually people in front of you. All right? There was usually people in front of you. That was like most of my cross-country races. But one race stayed in my mind for 30 years after high school. You say, well, Pastor, aren't you too young to be out of high school for 30 years? No. Like I said, this was my freshman year, and I had been finishing most of my races, or all my races, actually, in the middle of the pack, like I said. In this race, something clicked and something changed in the way that I ran. The starter gun went off, and everything was the same normal race. I was in the middle of the pack after mile one. Mile two started, and I told myself to stop thinking about the lead runner because that was my thought. It was constantly like, I have to get to them. I have to get to the one that's in first place. I don't care about all the other ones. I want the first place one. That was always my, and I would sit there and begin, you know, in my mind, I said, you know what? I need to stop thinking about that and keep my, fo- uh, my eyes focused on the one directly in front of me and push a little harder to catch that person. One by one, I began to p- uh, pick each one off. The next thing I knew, I was in fifth place with a mile left. Now, mind you, these races, you would have you know, anywhere from about 30 to 40 people. So the fact that I was in fifth place, I was pretty happy. And you say, how do you know? Because I could count the people that were in front of me. And I kept that same mindset. I said, you know, I'm going to keep my eyes on the next runner, and then I'm going to go get them every single time. The last half mile, I passed up, I passed up a runner for third place. And then, you know, you know, like I said, the last, you know, in, this last, uh, in this last mile, is when you normally begin to kick in the reserves because you say, you know what, i got to catch, the, uh, you know, go as fast as I possibly can to catch that person and leave nothing, leave nothing in the tank. So I started, you know, the thing is, is that I started, as I said, started to kick in those reserves and, and leave nothing there. And I started, you know, pulling closer to the number two runner. And then I passed them. I was closing in on first place, and it seemed as though this person was slowing down at this moment. But I was gaining on them, whichever way it was. About 40 feet from the finish line, I was within 10 feet of them. The first place runner must have heard the coach or maybe the crowd, but the thing was is that I saw him look back at me to see where I was at. How many of you know that if you run and you look back, you don't run as fast as you would if you kept your eyes focused where you're going? And I began to gain on him because of the fact that he began to look. And so he tried to run faster. Like I said, but you can't run faster or you're fastest when you're looking behind you. And as we got closer to, uh, to the finish line, I was within five feet in closing. And it was like you know, something that you would watch on the TV. Well, or, well at least it was for me. So in other words, the sins that are in front of you, and there's a reason why I didn't tell you how I finished. In other words, the sins in front of you that seem to be out of your reach push a little harder, gaining on them, and take them out one by one. 
You need to focus on that one thing. Don't sit there and focus on everything else that's going around you or you know, focus on that one big, huge one. Focus on each one and begin to pick them off, trying harder and pushing harder each time that you go. In other words, if you keep your eyes, if, if I keep my eyes on you, how are you, you know, how are you running your best when you've got your eyes on somebody else? The only way that any of us can run well is for us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. He is the only one that we have to run for in the first place. He is the race judge. He is the author and the finisher of this race of life. He gives the rewards. He, uh, he calls the race, and he is the one, the only one, to watch as the race progresses. Get your eyes off the other uh, runners and how they are doing, and get your eyes on Jesus and run your best race. Remember, who started the race for you? Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. He, here's the other thing. He finished our race for us, by the way. He finished our, uh, the race for us. As we run the race of life, let us take courage in the fact that Jesus Christ has already passed has already passed and run, uh, run this race for us. He ran the race ahead of us and has completed the race. In doing so, he completed the race as well. And this means the fact is, is that we will run and we will face the pressures of life. We have him to help us along. He knew his share of trials in the, uh, in the race of life, but he successfully navigated the course. I mean, look at all the things that Jesus himself had navigated. He was born to an unwed mother. He was born in a stable. He was born in a barn. He was born to poor parents. His life was threatened as a baby. His birth was the cause of terrible suffering. Can you, you think about the fact as he's growing up, that he's hearing the comments that people are making about not only him, but his mother and his stepfather. He was raised in a despicable town. Nazareth was not, you know, Nazareth was not this big, you know, posh place to live. It was not like this, oh, he's going to live in a mansion. He was hated and, uh, and opposed by others. He had no home and no place to lay his head. He was charged with insanity. They called him a lunatic. He was, uh, he was also charged with demon possession. He was opposed by his family. His, his family turned their back on him. He was rejected, hated, and opposed by the audience who came to hear him speak. He was betrayed by a close friend. He was left alone, rejected, and forsaken of all of his, by all of his friends. So not only does his family leave him, but his friends do as well. He was tried before the high court of the land and tried for treason, even though that he never did anything wrong. He was executed as a common criminal by the means of crucifixion. Yes, my friends, this morning, he has... Uh, been through it all and he is the perfect coach for those running the race today so instead of looking elsewhere for the, the help you need find your help in jesus and in him alone as we said as i said earlier we have already run the race why because of him and we cannot lose first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 the Bible says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has already given us the victory. We have that through them. So that way, at the end of our life, we can say, at the, like the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And number three is this, and I'll, uh, I'm going to go uh, quickly in this one. Number three is this, commit to a life of fulfilled racing. Another lesson that we could draw from the, from the passage is the truth that this life does not have to be a discouraging venture, but that it can be fulfilling, a fulfilling adventure. Let's remember the fulfillment of remembering what Jesus had, you know, how your life was before Jesus Christ and now how your life is after Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says this, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, 
Who can be against us? Who can be against us? Remember, the Bible says to consider him when the dark days come. We need to remember who he is. There is the fulfillment of reward. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians and look at the following verse. In chapter 15, verse 58, it says, Therefore, my, bro- my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know uh, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We must realize that the race that is set before us, we're not doing it in vain. We're not running around. But we can say, as we just read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, and then I'm going to add verse 8. It says this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished, a co- uh, finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for, uh, for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And uh, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So we need to realize that, you know, at the end of this, we're going to get a crown for what we've done. He's going to reward us. There's also the fulfillment, or the fulfillment of resting. We've talked about that, the fact that God's people will rest in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. Here's the thing. When we get to heaven, Revelation 21, verse 4, it says that, that the day will come where he will wipe away the tears of sorrow and exhaustion from our eyes, that there will be no more, power, uh, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sadness, no more sickness. That we don't have to worry about uh, grow, uh, growing weary and well-doing. Why? Because in, uh, in, in time, we shall reap a harvest. One day, we will join Jesus by the river of life in glory, and there will be... Uh, in, and there we will rest in his presence from the burdens of his life. Too many times I think we have the idea, I want to rest here. But the thing is, is that, you know what? We can keep on working here. You know why? Because the thing is, we have all of eternity to rest. Here's another thing. You know, is it is possible to rest in this life even as we run the race. How? By focusing on Jesus and leaning to abide in him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30 says, uh, says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He will let you run a race that, that will leave you fulfilled and rested. What we need to realize this morning, I know that you may be discouraged. I know you say, Pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through. I don't. He does. Don't let discouragement get you down. If you are battling today to, uh, to come to Jesus, let, he, let him refocus your priorities, lighten your load, and equip you to patiently run your race for his glory. There is help in him. This morning, do not leave this house without it. Do not leave this out, uh, the, house, this, the house of God this morning being discouraged. I ask that, you know, as uh, Tim you know, can find... Um, maybe some music to play in the background, that if you say, you know what, I am discouraged. I don't know what to do. I can't do this anymore. I ask that you will come forward and say, Jesus, and tell him why, because he cares for you. He wants to, you know, he wants to strengthen you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to lift you up. He wants you to, to be able to run this race, not discouraged, but encouraged, knowing that you can pick off each sin as it goes. Keep on, keep on chasing Keep on going. Keep on fighting. So for the next few moments, I ask that you will come forward and to say, Lord, I come to your altar saying, God, I need you. I'm discouraged. Please, Lord, I ask that you would encourage me this morning.